Hydrolytus. I think the fuel cells are foul. <laughs> no, I ate the fowls. The fuel cells are foul. <laughs> yes, Houston, my cells do need fuel, but the fuel cells... Forget it, Houston. All life on Earth depends on small amounts of sunlight energy, trapped and stored in plants. Eventually, this energy is transferred to organisms at higher trophic levels. But only a small part of the energy stored by one trophic level ever reaches the next. Nevertheless, Food chains transfer enough energy to support a vast diversity of organisms. Energy flow links all organisms in an ecosystem into food webs. It's tempting to carry this concept with us as we probe the mechanism of energy flow, the chemical changes within the living cell. It's intriguing to consider the cell as a tiny ecosystem and to explore the energy web that links the different organelles within the cell. The foundations of energy flow in every living cell are energy storage molecules forged by photosynthesis in plant cells. Since animal cells don't have organelles which trap sunlight, they depend for their function on molecules like glucose, which carry energy into the cell. Although we may be familiar with many organelles within an animal cell and their particular function, the study of energy flow takes us a step further to explore how these organelles interact. How do they transfer energy between them, send energy out of the cell, and bring it in? Energy flow even helps us explain why cells are generally so small. Imagine that it is a miniature factory. Goods enter and leave through doors. If the factory is made larger, more doors are needed for the flow of materials. But, as the factory grows, its volume increases rapidly. Much more rapidly than the surface area where the doors must be located. A point is reached when the number of doors in the surface can no longer service the inner volume. At this point, cells, like factories, tend to divide. The doorway to a cell is the membrane. It's of particular importance in animal cells, which cannot trap energy internally from sunlight. Energy must come from food, digested into molecules such as glucose, which are carried by the bloodstream. The molecules then penetrate the membrane. There are quite dramatic experiments which can be used to demonstrate the enormous energy available in a small amount of sugar. Of course, the last thing a cell needs is... The cell depends on the mitochondrion to extract the energy from glucose in a controlled way. The mitochondrion is shaped something like a peanut it has two complete membranes, an outer and an inner, which is folded to create regions called cristae. In a process called glucolysis, the breakdown of glucose begins outside the mitochondria. In a series of steps, glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid. This reaction also transfers hydrogen to NAD molecules and produces two ATP molecules for every glucose 
molecule. These ATP molecules carry energy off to fuel other cell functions. The NADH2 and the pyruvic acid are needed inside the mitochondria. The next step is called the Krebs cycle, or the citric acid cycle, and takes place in the fluid within the inner membrane. The Krebs cycle is fueled by pyruvic acid. This Krebs cycle produces the carbon dioxide we breathe out. And most important, the cycle generates more ATP and more hydrogen ions, which are transported away by carrier molecules. The final step in the breakdown of glucose takes place on the surface of the cristae. It uses the energy of electron carrier molecules to form an electron transport system. Think of a free energy pathway between molecules as a set of stairs with a molecule on each step. The molecules from the Krebs cycle carry the highest free energy. Electrons roll down the steps from molecule to molecule, losing energy as they go. The final step combines hydrogen ions, electrons, and the oxygen we breathe to form water. Normally, this reaction releases large amounts of energy as heat. But in this electron transport system, the energy is trapped instead and ultimately converted to ATP. Just how the ATP is formed is still a subject of controversy. The most popular theory focuses on the inner membrane of the cristae. The electron transport energy is thought to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane. The result is a concentration of hydrogen ions on one side of the membrane and hydroxyl ions on the other. The differential represents potential free energy. This potential difference is then exploited chemically to produce ATP. In plant chloroplasts, a variation on this theory uses the thylakoid membrane to explain how ATP is produced by the light reaction in photosynthesis. Sugars and starches transport energy between organisms and between cells. The mitochondrion is the energy exchange bank, converting glucose to ATP, which is the principal energy currency within the cell. For example, ATP provides energy for the formation of messenger molecules in the nucleus, which direct the use of ATP in ribosomes, forming enzymes which travel to the chloroplasts. Here the enzymes help convert sunlight to sugar, which is transported to the mitochondria where it is converted into ATP, and so on. Within our tiny artificial ecosystem, the cell is a complex web of molecular transport. Expand this simple example a thousandfold to catch just a hint of the true complexity of energy flow within the cell. <laughs>